The system of power built by Russian dictator Vladimir Putin is unviable. It could collapse at any moment. The leader of the Russian Communists, chairman of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, Gennady Zyuganov, announced this at a plenary session of the State Duma. He called on the deputies not to be deceived by the rating figures, which indicate high support from the population. This is a phantom that can collapse in a second. As for the political system, I must say that it is unstable in our country. I think that those who are involved in the political system in the Kremlin, they are taking a risk in our country. People do not come to the elections. God forbid one thing happens, two, three, and it will collapse. I saw how the ratings collapsed. 95% voted for Gorbachev. Then in his homeland, he did not collect even half a percent, Zyuganov said. It should be noted that Zyuganov has headed the Russian communists since the very inception of the Russian Federation. He is absolutely loyal to the Putin regime, being an integral part of it. And thanks to this loyalty, the politician has remained in the position of head of the Communist Party for more than a quarter of a century. Earlier, another State Duma deputy made a bold statement about SBO. Russian MP Alexander Borodai, who stood at the origins of aggression against Ukraine, made a defeatist statement. He complained about problems in the army and the lack of clear goals of the war. He complained that the majority of the population in Russia does not support the so-called SVO and wants it to end as soon as possible. There is a declaration of unity, but we do not have unity in society. It is not true that it exists. We have very few of those who participate in the SVO in one way or another. Somewhere around 5 to 7 million at most. The rest pretend that this is not their war. You there, hurry up, finish it already, because we are already very tired of this war. This is the position of the majority of society, the Russian deputy said. He also noted the lack of a clear ideology in the Kremlin. Even the top leadership of the Russian Federation does not know what will happen after the war is over. Borodai stressed that the war did not go according to plan. He also acknowledged that the Russian Federation is running out of resources to continue it. The United States is committed to making sure that every dollar we have at our disposal will be sent to Ukraine by January 20th, Secretary of State Antony Blinken told journalists on Wednesday during a visit to the NATO headquarters in Brussels. Concerns about the U.S.'s ongoing commitment to supporting Ukraine, and to NATO more broadly, have been swirling since Donald Trump won the presidential election last week. Trump, with varying degrees of consistency, has been critical of NATO and support for Ukraine and Taiwan, two democracies under threat that depend on U.S. military support to counter Russia and China. He has shown little interest in the long-standing U.S. role as anchor of strategic alliances with European and Indo-Pacific democracies. Before the election, partners and adversaries already were re-evaluating their security arrangements in preparation for Trump's possible return. Blinken also insisted that now was the time for Israel to end its war in Gaza and called for more extensive humanitarian pauses in the fighting there. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, first, it's a pleasure, uh, as always, to be back uh, at NATO. Uh, we had very good discussions with Secretary General Mark Rutte. Delighted to see him at the helm of the alliance uh, in this critical moment. Uh, as well as with uh, all of our NATO colleagues at the uh, North Atlantic Council. Uh, the purpose of this visit is to focus our efforts on ensuring that Ukraine has the money, the munitions, and the mobilized forces to fight effectively in 2025 or to be able to negotiate a peace from a position of strength. Uh, we've obligated just uh, recently and pushed out the door another $8 billion in security assistance for Ukraine that was in September, another almost uh, half a billion dollars uh, just a few weeks ago, and President Biden is committed to making sure that every dollar we have at our disposal will be pushed out the door between now and January 20th. Uh, on the Middle East and on Gaza, um, let me be very clear about both the intent and the effect of uh, the letter that Secretary Austin and I sent uh, a month ago to our Israeli counterparts. The intent was to inject a sense of urgency with Israel to take necessary steps to address the dire humanitarian situation of children, women, and men uh, in Gaza. 
The effect has been that of the 15 steps that we urged action on, Israel has taken action, either in implementing or in the, being in the process of implementing 12 of the 15 steps. There are three uh, big issues that need, still need to be addressed that come from the, the letter. Uh, short of ending the war, which we believe now is the time to move to that, um, we have to see these humanitarian steps fully implemented, sustained, and as I said, particularly with regard to pauses, having more extensive pauses. One final thing on this. Um, Israel has to meet these responsibilities, um, and we will be tracking this every single day. Mexico is facing a second Donald Trump presidency, and few countries can match its experience as a target of Trump's rhetoric. There have been threats to close the border, impose tariffs and even send U.S. forces to fight Mexican drug cartels if the country doesn't do more to stem the flow of migrants and drugs. That's not to mention what mass deportations of migrants who are in the U.S. illegally could do to remittances, the money sent home by migrants, that have become one of Mexico's main sources of income. But as much as this second round looks like the first round, when Mexico pacified Trump by quietly ceding to his immigration demands, circumstances have changed, and not necessarily for the better. Today, Mexico has in Claudia Scheinbaum a somewhat stern leftist ideologue as president, and Trump is not known for handling such relations well. Back in 2019, Mexico's then-president Andres Manuel López Obrador was a charismatic, plain-spoken, folksy leader who seemed to understand Trump, because both had a transactional view of politics, you give me what I want, I'll give you what you want. The two went on to form a chummy relationship. But while López Obrador was forged in the give-and-take politics of the often corrupt former ruling party, the Institutional Revolutionary Party, or PRI, Scheinbaum grew up in a family of leftist activists and got her political experience in radical university student movements. Scheinbaum made a point of being one of the first world leaders to call Trump on Thursday to congratulate him after the election, but during the call Trump did two things that may say a lot about how things will go. First, Scheinbaum said, Trump quickly brought up the border to remind her there were issues there. Then he asked Scheinbaum to send his greetings to López Obrador, with whom Trump said he had a very good relationship. That might suggest that Trump believes that López Obrador, the new president's political mentor, is still in charge, a view shared by some analysts. Not everything has changed for the worse, cross-border trade has topped $800 billion per year and U.S. companies are more dependent than ever on Mexican plants. But the U.S. Mexico-Canada Trade Agreement, or USMCA, is coming up for review, and Mexico has made legal changes that Trump could seize on to demand a renegotiation of parts of the deal. Scheinbaum has suggested Mexico won't give in even if backed into a corner. But standing up hasn't worked particularly well before. 